regulation. This is the place where I spend the most time in my practice. The other stuff is technical, right? How are we gonna get there? And where this is the hard stuff is when we have big feelings but we don't know what to do with them. So I really, I don't know how exceptional minds actually handles big feelings when big feelings happen here. How do you guys handle big feelings when they happen here? Inevitably that they happen. We have behavioral team. Oh, okay. That, that helps with managing. Yeah. Depending on how big it gets, sometimes it can handle the classroom and it's handled the teachers, but if, if, it, if it gets bigger than that, then they um, come and they talk with the vehicle team. Okay. All right. So um, I think that this is the hardest thing because what we want to do in these moments is be logical. Okay. Why are you acting like this? This doesn't make any sense, right? When the brain or when you're emotional, you're working from the bottom part of your brain. From the amygdala that is a fight flight free center you are not meant to be thinking at that time that is the that is the part of the brain that gets activated by seeing a bear right because really if you see a bear and you're hiking you probably should be like what are my options <laughs> <laughs> i could right you are going to do something pretty quickly without thinking about it right um that's what actually happens when you have a big emotion so when we're trying to appeal to someone that's having a big emotion that way, you know, it doesn't work. And then that becomes frustrating for the helper. And it also overstimulates the person that's having a big emotion. So um, this is those moments, and, and, and this is a moment that's different than like before a big emotion and after a big emotion. I'm talking about when the big emotion is happening in the moment, okay? Um, but how do we help people have feelings, big feelings, without being completely engulfed or overwhelmed by them? How do we help someone ex describe or explain their emotions in a way that's not offensive or in a way that don't isolate them? All right? And I think all of you can understand that, right? Where, gosh, I want to help you, but you are not, I don't really want to help you because of the way in which you're communicating with me. And that, so that, there's a rub there. How do we help? our students, our children, talk about their emotions and still get help, right? Even if that helps you do nothing, which is really, really hard. All right. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. All right, yeah, so I love this. Don't promise when you're happy, don't apply when you're angry, and don't decide when you're sad. This is something that we, uh, I, we talk about all the time, right? Because we, we always overpromise when we're happy. We say yes. Oh, wow, how did I get myself into four committees? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm on four committees. Okay. <laughs> don't reply when you're angry, and all of you know that you've read a text or an email or you've seen a post and you want to do something and you know you shouldn't. Right? Don't reply when you're angry. Um, and don't decide when you're sad. Right? Because sadness is one of those one of those emotions that's a very powerless emotion. Um, and so, and so uh, we tend to make decisions that actually negatively affect us when we're sad. So um, the, big, the, the big picture is don't make, it, don't make a decision when you have a big emotion of any kind, right? Let it pass um, and then reflect on it later. So the thing that I find helps when someone's in a big emotion is to listen and label it. Listen, label, reflect. I see you're really upset. Right? Like, don't try to go fix it. Like, you are mad. I see that. Um, Excuse me. Yes. I've heard some people say yeah. that telling another person that they're upset is a very distressing thing to that person and stops communication. Ah. When, when it's said in that way, I see that you're upset. Yeah. Oh. I didn't know if you noticed that or if you've run into that. I tend to see reflection, if done genuinely, not versus like, you know what, I know you're upset. Like, and so I, maybe it's in the delivery of it, but what I found in the work that I've done is if I say, you know, I see that you're angry. I see that, that this situation you, has made you very angry. Mm -hmm. I see that that usually takes the momentum out of the big emotion to a point where we can talk about it. So maybe it's in the delivery. Uh, so there maybe so the, there would be the difference between a reflection and a judgment. Mm -hmm. Maybe reflections tend to help with emotions versus judging them. So I would I would just put that maybe differentiation out. Yeah. Oh, I just I say it makes a difference to one of my daughters in particular if I say to me, it looks to me as yeah. if 
blah, blah, blah. It's the vocabulary. So I'm not sure. saying I know what you're thinking. Or I'm guessing, or yeah. I'm imagining, or, or what I'm picking up on is, right, yeah. I statements are great, and, and we'll, get in, we'll get into that too. Um, but being able to reflect what you believe is happening. It's all, you also probably need a good relationship with your child in order to do this. Uh, you know, if you don't have a good relationship with your child, because this can be challenging or it can feel um, challenging, then that's definitely to be considered, for sure. Yeah. Um, I find that, that it tends to help. And I find it tends to help because then that person feels seen and heard and uh, understood in that moment. I think um, you're validating when you say, you know, you're reflecting, you're validating. Yeah, they're already they're already upset. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and at that when you get kids that start to get older, um, that's the point in which you can then be collaborative. You know, what is, can I be helpful right now? You know, if not, like no, I want you to get out of here. So, oh, I'm gonna be in the other room. And if you need me, come get me. Right? But it still puts it, it it still allows them to have their emotion and allows them to direct. Um, I you know, we even now I still build emotional vocabulary with my teens and my adults. And what I mean by that is do I have different words to symbolize how I feel? Right? There's a difference between irritability and frustration. There's a difference between disappointment and sadness. There's a difference between happy, like a happiness and you know, an excitement. Um, those are different qualities of emotions. And so um, we tend to go in and try to label them so that um, it gives my guys and gals a way in which they can problem solve for themselves. That's with more specificity. When I get I feel good and bad, it really, really shuts down what, what we can kind of talk about because it's just two things. So um, we go in and we build some emotional vocabulary. Um, sometimes when, you, when they say, that, can I help you? And they go, get out of here. And you go, okay, I'm leaving. Like, I'm, I'm leaving. To be able to let them be. To really be able to honor that. I think what can happen is some parents can't help it. And then they'll re-enter that situation. And, and what, what they will continue to escalate the situation. That's what I found happened. So, allow them to have their own emotions. And sometimes, I find this with my teenage guys and girls, they don't necessarily want to talk to their parents about all of this stuff. Um, that's normal, by the way. That's a normal thing. Okay. Practice the delaying of gratification. <laughs> this is like a societal thing. This is not just a thing for, for this, for our population. But how many of you guys actually practiced delaying gratification? The delay, the delay of, yeah, the delay of a reward, right? The delay of something. Whether it's you worked for something and you waited. Okay. Um, so have you guys, has anyone heard about the marshmallow test? That's come out actually quite a bit, yeah. So they did this marshmallow test a long time ago, and, and what they said to these kids, they were little kids, they were like five and under. It's like, here's a marshmallow, okay? If you can wait, you can have it if you want, but if you wait until I get back, you'll get to. That was, the, that was the experiment, okay? So these researchers left a marshmallow, and they left. Um, and they left for like, I don't know, it was like five minutes or something. And they just kind of watched what these kids did, right? And uh, many kids ate that marshmallow. Oh, they ate it, it was so bad. And some waited, because if they, they knew that when the researcher came back, they would have two marshmallows instead of the one. So they were always guaranteed the one. You could eat it right then and there. Or you could wait, and then you'd come back in two. And that test actually, has now become the biggest predictor of life success. They use this test all over the place and all in all these different countries about the predictor of success. And really the idea is your ability to delay gratification is a huge predictor in your ability to navigate this world. And it's just such an interesting thing. Um, more so than SAT scores, uh, they found, more so than GPA. Uh, so this that alone. So if there was anything you did, right, delaying of gratification, being able to wait for something, call me, basically. All right, mindfulness, we talked about that. Um, there's a whole host of mindfulness strategies out there. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's like very hot right now, actually, if you were to look into that. Um, I think the only thing that happens with mindfulness is people try it and they, uh, 
they just get a taste of it and they don't really commit to it and they go, oh, this doesn't work. But really, this is a practice. And so for mindfulness to work, you need to practice. Here's the other thing. You guys as parents need to engage in self-care also. Um, and I find that my parents run themselves ragged. Um, and so there, there's nothing left for them. So how many of you guys take care of yourselves? <laughs> you gotta take care of yourself. Um, you know, your, your kids see you, um, and they definitely depend on you. And, and even though we're in this population where we're working with social skills and emotions, I would say that my clients really can pick up on their parents' emotions, actually. They really get it. They know when their parents are upset, they know when they're stressed, they know when they're happy, they know. They know. So, um, the research shows too, though, that if you have a lot of negative emotions in the household, you've got kids that are less able to regulate their own emotions. Mm -hmm. And you see, you, you see that. That's, just, that's in general research. Okay. All right. Um, you know, we talked about this. Here's, here's some ideas of mindfulness. Uh, there's some apps that are really cool on the iPhone if you wanted to use technology. Um, there's My Calm Beat and iBreathe, and those are just ways to really promote deep breathing. Breathing is like the way to hijack your emotional system. If you can get your kids to deeply breathe, you can get them back up to upper brain again to use some logic. But if you can't get them to the upper brain, don't bother using logic because it will just, you guys will pull a thumb on the knees and just drive off the cliff together. Um, so breathing is huge. The other thing that um, we talk about in my office is using the body. If you can't, calm things down by language, because usually you can't, to address the body. To go for a walk. Go, um, if you, you know, if you're, some people have a swimming pool, but like, go for swimming is great. I can't even say any more about swimming. Swim, 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 swim. Religiously, so be yep. grateful to a God. Yes. It's very helpful. Yeah, and even I Even for normal population. Yes, it's so true. And I would even say that people who do have religious practices find a lot of uh, comfort through things um, like praying the rosary or like because those are there, there's a ritual to this piece that's very calming for them so I would completely agree if you have if you definitely have that then yeah yeah that's great okay I know I always say in my practice like get away from scripting get away don't script stop the scripting ah. and when emotions are high like script Rely on the script, right? Rely on the script because your emotions are so high, no one's thinking. And when your kids have high emotions, you get them too, right? I always say emotions are transmitted. You can walk into a room and know that your friends just got into a fight. They might not say anything, right? But you know you walked into a situation where you're like, oh, it's cold in here. Like, ooh, I know something happened. Even though you weren't there, right? Emotions are transmitted. It's just like Wi-Fi, <laughs> right? It's like, I, I got it, you know? You don't necessarily need um, any kind of permission to experience that emotion because you got it, right? You've been in all of those situations. So you are also affected by your child's emotions. When they're high, you're affected too. So rely on scripts. And so the scripts that we use in my office would be one, reflection, two, an offering of help. That's, uh, that's as easy as it is. Um, that I found works. Okay. Okay. Social skills and communication. Um, I would say that most of my adults in their 20s want a relationship. They want some sort of significant relationship. That's probably their top goal. Um, and I think this is the where my biggest challenge is. It's where I can use the most motivation, right? Like, they just want a book on the fastest ways to get a girlfriend. What is the magic? And I'm like, look, I, you don't need a magic book. Let me just, one, here's something I know. Take a shower every day, right? Like, there are some things I can tell you, you don't need to, we don't need to get by into any kind of special thing. And, you know, I have a client that just got suckered into a $200 program on like, the guarantee of getting a girlfriend. Yeah. You asked, uh, I asked my daughter, how did you go? Fine. And I said, what did you do? Nothing. Did you have a day? But when I asked her, was there any drama? Oh, yeah. 
But I have to, you know, just have a conversation with her. She won't, you know, she didn't fall down or had a great day, but she just, it was fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like this is like uh, normal in the teen, mm -hmm. in like every, like the teenage population in general, like, you know. Um, and as parents, we just want to know, right? We just want to know. We just want to have a conversation about it. And I think the art of conversation is dying. Um, and it's dying because we're not um, really, really forced anymore to talk face to face. Because um, now everything's pretty quick, right? Everything's um, on your phone. It's so many characters or less. I mean, there, there's, it's, it's interesting in that way. Um, but I will say my guys that do the best out in the world have conversational skills. They're able to hold conversations with people face to face. Yeah. She, she, just, she knows how to answer, oh, you know, if you ask her, oh, this is really nice, oh, oh great, oh, no worries. Just knows how to answer those quick questions, you know. What the, yeah. She has a, uh, how can I say, uh, a repertoire of how to answer each question. But there's not nothing just two two questions. It's never logged back to you yeah. in other words. That's it. And she doesn't answer it and correct it, but it's not enough to say wow, you're a conversation. Yeah, and you know, I think that the other piece too is the way to think about conversations is the person who's asking the most questions is the one in control. So um so the you know the thing there is just um sometimes you could just set it up like, all right, you know what, I'm gonna be the I, I might say this. I'm going to be a really pesky mom, and you're not going to be able to leave until you ask me three questions. <laughs> like, just, just to practice, because, um, uh, you know, you'll find value in that later. Um, but yeah, I know, I know. I hear you. That's a regular thing. It's like, okay, I got one word answers with nothing back. There's only so much I can ask. Yeah. I get talked at a lot. Oh, yes. Um, there's yes. no reciprocity. Yeah. Um, and if I do try to have a two-way conversation, then interest is lost. Yeah. yeah. And you know what I might say in that moment is like, I need you to do something for me. Like, I'm asking you as your mom to have a con for us to have a reciprocal conversation about this only for like five minutes or like whatever. Because I think. They're 30 seconds, yeah, whatever. But, but, but then it's like they're not kind of being fandangled into something that they're like, wait a minute, I never signed up for this. But it's just like, hey, as your mom, I, I want to know. I want to have a conversation with you as my son. Um, so sit down, because we're going to have it. You know what I mean? But then they should be really clear about what the intent is, um, which is that. You know, it's for us to know and for us to share an experience or share experiences with our children, be connected to them in some way. And I, it works, that works. Or like when a parent's so worried and they're trying to drive their kid into doing something because they're worried, the, the parent's worried, I just say to that parent, hey, share with them how you feel about it. Well, I'm, I'm worried to death about this. I'm, I'm, I'm worried to death. And this is what I would like you to do because I'm worried. The, the conversation completely changes from that point. So, yeah. I don't know when you were going to finish up on this, but I thought there was one other piece that was specific to this population, and that yeah. is having all that information, body language, words, everything coming all at once is a very difficult thing. Yes. I've had to learn that myself. Yes. And so, you know, I think filtered conversations, that thing on the phone sometimes, whatever else, um, there's some means of verbal communications through games. All of that is a lot easier to do than it is to actually sit down, look at somebody face to face and talk to them. Yeah. And have reciprocity to know when to stop. You know, this is particularly different difficult I think for this population. Yeah. That's been my experience. I don't know. Yeah, there, well there's a sensory bombardment. Yeah. Um, I think is what happens. And we get overloaded with the amount of sensory information that's coming in. So what my, my suggestion to that is always inoculation. Right? How do we inoculate just a little bit at a time? Which is that's why it's like, hey, do do I, you know? I might say this like, all right, all right, you know, you just just help me out here. I might say that to a client like, all right, okay, this is me, this is what I want, you know. We're gonna do it for like thirty seconds, right? You know, and we're gonna do it, and you're gonna do it because I asked you and you like me. <laughs> I might say something like that um, because relationships so critical there. I think humor. I people that work with me know that I'm. I'm direct, but I'm humorous. Um, and that's just my own personality. That's what I bring into my life. Um, but yeah. But the humor is so much different than ours. You know? What, is uh, what the therapist? Yeah. Oh, about their humor. Our kids' humor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. laughing and they're the therapist. 
I know. And they just think you're nuts. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just say, like, I know, I know, it's, I, I'm nuts, but you're not going to be able to leave until you, you, uh, you do this with your, with your good old mom. You know, um, it's worth it. It is worth it. Um, all right. You want to? Oh, yeah. I worry that Facebook is killing me for communication. Like, no, 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 no. All right. Um, let's just talk about executive functioning, and, and, and I want to leave some, some time for questions, if you guys have questions, but we kind of talked about this already, and um, this is like a hot, like this is like the new topic, and I laugh, because I'm like, well, we've talked about this for a long time, but going back to sensory bombardment and having a conversation, executive functioning is also a bombardment, right? Because there's so many things that you have to keep track of at one time. So in my office, I've got like a four by six foot whiteboard. And we map everything. We just map it all. Um, that's really helpful because it reduces the field and it puts things into a visual realm for, for, for my clients, and that's very helpful. But I only solve problems that my client thinks are problems. That's the first place to start. Because if I don't have someone motivated to solve the problem, then I'm just going through the exercise for myself, right? So they, it needs to be a problem that they bring. And that could be, I don't want to have a curfew at 10 p.m. That's my problem. That's what we figure out, right? I don't want to have my computer shut down at midnight. Okay, let's figure that out, right? What is the problem that's really, what's relevant for that particular person? Not necessarily the parent. Unless it's become the parent's problem and now it's the kid's problem because there's so much conflict. And then, then that's something that we talked about. All right. Um, everyone, uh, the, the other thing that I'm seeing right now is that everyone believes that um, if they get executive functioning, everything's going to be okay. But <laughs> executive functioning is not a cure all, you know? Um, and, and some of my adults, like some of my adults that I work with that don't have a disability, don't do executive functioning that well either. <laughs> so it's a process and it's a skill. Um, the biggest thing, though, too, is you got to hold reasonable expectations. And so I think some of the expectations that we hold as a society are really high for our teenagers. Because really, the brain's actually not ready for what they're being charged with to do yet. Um, and Can you give me an example of that? Yeah. And so you know, in high school, we were expecting so many different things, especially as we were maybe applying to college. And you got to keep all these things in play. And we just kind of go, well, gosh, you're 17. You should be able to plan all your homework, do all your homework, get your college apps in, you know, get score in the SAT. You know, oh, we go on and on. And the reality is the, that that frontal part of that brain isn't really fully maturing until the mid to late 20s. So just organically, we're not ready for it yet. You know, um, and so we just have to be realistic. And what I just say is, whatever they can do, expect that they can do, and then teach the other stuff. Like that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, you might, I mean, this is how you this is how you break something down, right? You analyze the task that's meaningful. You strategize. You organize the steps. This is the most important part. Deadlines. <laughs> no one, not even me make tasks about deadlines, right? And then the other thing that I think is really helpful, evaluate how much energy you think you're going to spend on it. Because what you'll find is either a pattern of avoidance for high energy things, right? And maybe, um, or that the low stuff gets done really quickly. So if that's helpful, and that helps with actually determining timing. Because some of my guys, they're not very good at predicting how much time something might take when I know it's probably going to take them three to four times longer than they think that happens. Um, being able to come back and modifying the task, uh, that's, that's the piece. And then being able to say, hey, was that good? Did that work? What am I trying? To approach this through curiosity versus judgment is really helpful. So how do I, how do I approach things with an open mind versus um, gosh, I'm terrible at this. Have any of you guys read Carol Dweck's Growth Mindset? I would highly suggest that book. Growth Mindset is a lovely book. Carol Dweck. I can um, send I can add that. Uh, D-W-E-C-K. She talks about a fixed versus growth mindsets, and it's all about the language that we use in how we talk to ourselves about 
how we are. So for her, uh, she says, and if you believe that I believe this, growth happens at all times, right? It doesn't matter how old you are. Everyone has the potential for change and growth. Um, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be a therapist, actually. Um, and that, you know, the time of, oh gosh, you need to do that before they were five. That was the critical period. We know that that's not the case anymore. You know, yeah, is that effective? Yeah, that can be really effective. Um, but we know that in, in your, your brain changes. Your brain continues to change until you die. Which is great, right? All right. So uh, yeah. from the, from the timing. Yeah. I think this population, at least our experience, this population is that there's a lot of attention to doing things perfectly. Yep. So that yep. the schedule seems unattainable. Yes, perfectionism. So that, yeah. I think, is a real barrier. Do you have any keys to helping set the proper expectations of self together with setting a timeline to get things done? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so challenging. Um, I see perfectionism as compensatory, meaning perfectionism is compensating for something else. So um, if I can get down to what that something else is, I have a better, uh, I have a, I'm more effective at dealing with the perfectionism. So what I would say for the perfectionism is you might need to inoculate imperfection. So how do you deal a little bit with this not going well? So something that we do in my office that causes a ton of distress. Mind you, we work on coping strategies first, okay? We do get coping strategies out of the bat before we distress clients is something like, here's a coloring page. Please color out of the lines. You, you, you would never guess that that would be so painful. But it's like, there is nothing writing on this coloring sheet of my Doctor Who TARDIS, right? Like, because I really, I love geeky things, and so I have geeky things in my office. And like, he would be fine with this. You color outside of the box, you know, like literally outside of the box. But inoculating imperfection is really, really helpful. And if the perfectionism is compensating for my belief that I can do things, well then, you gotta address that piece. So, yeah. Um, do we need to do this? No, I keep going. Let's see. Oh, yeah. If plan A, A, A fails, remember that you have 25 left. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's good. Okay. So, uh, let's open it up to questions, I guess. What I would say in, in those moments is to be very mindful about what, what you're actually pushing. Pushing is a really interesting word, right? Because if I were to push somebody, I would usually push them from behind, right? Like, like you know, you just to just push back, push against. Yeah, like, and so what your I think your natural inclination is to resist, you know, like what. So what I would say is, if you can collaborate with the next step, collaborate with your child on the next step. Like, what what is it that you want to do next? Independent. Well, how do you, what, what do you see? And that's hard because that's a little bit of crystal balling or a few. But I think at the adult ranges, even at the late teenage ranges, what I find to be most effective is when the client is the collaborator. They tell us what direction. So here, I, I'll give you a good example. Would you mind just, could you just quickly repeat the question? Oh, yeah, yeah. So she was talking about the gentle push, the, gent the gentle push by Tom Brandon. And it's like, you know, that's so hard to determine, like, what, what is a gentle push, and when do you push, and that, so that's, that's where, that was the question. And I have a client that, um, the mom really wanted a social skills school in the IEP, okay? Um, and he, you know, he's, he's 17, and she really felt like he needed one, especially, like, in, this, in, in a certain class. Anyway, um, and he's like, no, I don't need a social skills goal. Right? So we're going back and forth, back and forth. And I finally was like, look, do you think you need a social school goal? No, I don't. Okay. It's done then. We're done. There is no social skills goal. Right? We can't have a social skills goal. So what I said to him was like, why do you think your mom wants you to have a social skills goal? Which is kind of a loaded question. But what it got us to is him wanting to be more socially appropriate around females. That's really what it was about. And when we could get there and that he wants to date and stuff, we got to a different place. But I would say that now it's time to collaborate. Because if you got to get the buy-in, right? If you can lead the horse to water, 
right? That, that you can't make them break. And I have experienced this so much. So whatever you can get the intrinsic motivation behind, that is that's the one that you want to make movement around. And you gotta get they're buying the certain yes. things because, yes. because if I always left that decision up to my son, he would be in his room isolated yeah. for the rest of his life. That's right. And so so as a parent, what we would do then is we would make some choices about maybe finagling demands or expectations about nudging that out, right? So be like, you know, our rule is that you gotta exercise every day. Like that's our household rule. Like whatever, right? Yeah. You, and, and you know, like that's a win-win, right? That's good for emotions. That's good for health. That's good for getting you out of your room so you're not isolated. Or, you know, um, and then you, you navigate around those. So it's not. So we squarely know that he's not motivated to do that, but that you're setting that expectation. That's reasonable, right? And so that's the, So those would be that's your a reasonable lunch, right? Yeah. Your, so so um, the other thing that I do in the office a lot is I always say like I plant seeds and then like I water them and then I water them and then I fertilize them and then I water them and because over time I want my clients to, they I want them to believe they thought of it because if they think that I told them to do it or their parent told them to do it they don't want to do it but if they came up with it by themselves that's a different situation so just nudging nudging the other thing um, that could be helpful if your son could tolerate it is um, so a lot of people say well what's your opinion what do you think we should do and I would say well I'm, I'm biased right because I would be telling you a decision based on my own journey my own life but let's go over what the possible consequences are to the decision positive and negative and then you and then we we empower you to make a choice so that's another approach okay, okay. any other questions how do you uh like uh, when, when I have a conversation with my son, usually about school or something, um, you know, he'll he'll begin like say on I don't know Godzilla, you know, we'll start on Godzilla, and while we're talking, I mean, in the first ten minutes, Godzilla is interesting, you know, by the fiftieth year that Godzilla has existed, I'm like Zach, I can't take any more about Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you don't even care about what I, I said, no, that's not it. I said, I don't have the passion for 50 years of Godzilla. I know. And then he, he, he's like, oh, you didn't even care about Godzilla anyway. And I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, what's, a, what's the right way to shift the content of the I love, I, this is so, I love this because it's so candid and so real, and it reminds me of um, Wooly Mammoths, because I had a client that mm -hmm. loves Wooly Mammoths, and, and um, I really don't like, I don't, not that I don't like Wooly Mammoths, but I really have not thought about Wooly Mammoths, I don't know, for a <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm talking about all of this, and I'm helping him like read nonverbal cues, and you know, I start, I start to like do things like, yeah. I tried that. No. I fell to the ground. I fell to the ground. I pretended to sleep. And he went, he went over to me and he just went like this. And so I was like, no, no, I don't want to go to Madness. I can't take it. Um, you know, earlier when we talked about where do you, where do you stop and where does he begin? That, that's, that's actually that piece, right? Like, no, Zach, you love Wooly Mammoths. And I don't like Wooly Mammoths, but I do love you. So it's it's the ability to say like I tolerate listening to no 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 sorry Godzilla uh, I was thinking of myself for a moment but to say that you know like you love you love Godzilla and um and I love you and I put up with listening to Godzilla um and so but I can only do that for so long mm -hmm. you know and it doesn't mean I don't love you it just means that I don't really have any more interest in Godzilla you know and he might just uh, but just keep repeating the same thing. Yeah. Yep. My son's Godzilla is war history. Oh, oh yes. Oh, war history. That is another popular topic. And, yes. Um, yes. Yes. and you know, we've been, it's, it's been since he was yes. very, very young. And so now when he's got something he's passionate about, I, I, and I've explained to him before, I know you love it. I don't love it the same way you do. Mm -hmm. Six minutes. Tell me what you can tell me in six yeah. minutes. <laughs> and now we've got to the point when he comes to me with these 35-minute YouTube videos right. on some obscure, you know, war 
weapon, um, he knows the video has to be five minutes or under. So he, now he doesn't bring anything that's not five minutes. And so we can share it now, but in a way that, that I can digest and live with. You know, I think that's lovely. Well, and that's lovely because what he's acknowledging is your where you started it. See, that's that's great, right? He knows that that's your tolerance for World War II tank weapons, what, what, whatever, yeah, whatever, 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 whatever that could be, which honestly is necessary in in a relationship, because in any if you were to have another uh, significant relationship, you know. I, unless, unless she also loved the history, <laughs> which, <laughs> which would be thrilling and lovely, yes. and they imagine imagine the the things that could be talked about and the history that could be analyzed. Yeah. Yes. I have a daughter here, and there's most of boys here, and she has a boyfriend which she's had for a really long time, and she's sort of tired of him. <laughs> break up with him. And I said, well, that's okay, but he's your one friend that you really have something to do with. You don't seem to be willing to make any other friends. There's all these boys at the school, but you won't talk to them. And so I said, I'll make you a deal. If you start talking to these boys here, then you can break up with your boyfriend. <laughs> but you're not allowed to break up with your boyfriend until you learn someone else to go. Certain way. 
Um, so we, you know, we got to get down to the bottom of, of what that is. Um, it could be to gain uh, positive feedback, or, or unfortunately, becomes reinforcing to get that kind of feedback. You know what I mean? I would say with perfectionists, the thing to and maybe and this is where Carol Dweck's book would be really helpful. Uh, a good read would be to focus on process instead of product. Mm -hmm. So focus on effort versus focus on product. Um, an example of that would be um, my daughter. My daughter plays um, ice hockey, and you know my expectation of of her in those moments is uh, like in a game situation or a practice situation would be I don't expect any goals. Like, don't care if you score a goal. I do care though that you come off the ice and when your helmet comes off, you're sweating us. Full effort. Yeah. Um, that really changes the nature, you know, the, the quality of, of that game, and at least I'm intangible, you know. Um, and, and I, there's lots of other things that we, we might talk about, but like I, I don't care about the goals, you know. Goals are just, they're not my my focus. Um, I'm just wanting full effort and full participation. So if there's any way you can do that and shift maybe the attention um, to the process and the effort, that might shift things. But um, but usually perfectionism is, it's hiding something else, and unfortunately, it gets rewarded societally. So there's this, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> on that, <laughs> on, on that <laughs> note, yeah. thank you so much, Glenn. And everybody, please join us. <laughs> December 10th is our next parent meeting. We'll have Diane Danis and oh. she's a very wonderful Yay. woman. Uh, she's right. a developmental pediatrician, and she's going to be talking about managing anxiety in young adults. Great. So thank you, everybody, for coming and sharing all of your expertise with us. Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. And um, see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you.